Thank you for having us back. I guess the first panel went okay. Um, without further ado, uh, we're going to welcome the senior senator from Colorado, Michael Bennett. Senator, thank you for, uh, I have to say, there are 85 students here from Colorado College. All right. More, more than any other delegation in the place. All right. Well, thank you for, for joining uh, J Street's panel on civility at baseball games. We're, we're thrilled <laughs> to have you. Just kidding. We think that's stupid, too. Um, so... We've been asking everyone... It's nice to see you guys, by the way. It's great to see you This as well. place ran a lot better when you were here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, now we have a podcast. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> I graduated to uh, reading underwear ads, so things are going well. So we're asking everybody some version of this question. Um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, uh, we assume potentially Senator Sanders... Uh, I've been open to the idea of conditioning aid to Israel if Israel annexes the West Bank or if there's continued settlement construction. Curious where you land on uh, whether or not you consider conditioning or withholding aid as levers to stop annexation I, or settlement I would say not probably where those guys landed. Uh, and I, in making the decision, I would want to know and have a, a, a strong understanding of what the effect would be on the domestic politics in Israel if we decided we were going to withhold aid. Would that strengthen the position of the people that we were, um, whose uh, actions we were objecting to, which sometimes happens? When you've lived as I have for 10 years with Mitch McConnell, you know, I've often said that I would never want anybody I know to be as malevolent or as cynical as Mitch McConnell is. <laughs> but I do think we need to be as strategic as Mitch McConnell is. And I think we need to be as strategic as Prime Minister Netanyahu is. And I'm not sure we always have that. But, I mean, just to push you on this a little bit, because it does feel like the context has changed, right? I mean, the, the status quo means more settlement construction, the, the potential of eliminating the possibility of a contiguous Palestinian state because of that construction. I mean, don't we need some sort of I, I don't pressure have any, track? I don't have any disagreement with that at all, and I don't think... They should be building settlements, and I do think we should be doing everything we can to limit the settlements that are being built. I just wonder whether there are bigger ways for us to think about how to do that in terms of the t t totality of the relationship that we have. If we pick one instrument like that in this town, that very quickly is going to be become a partisan litmus test for where people are in Israel. And I think what we really need is a president who's confident enough in their leadership and confident enough in what we're trying to do to push back. And uh, I would push back if I were president on a, a range of dimensions uh, in an effort to try to keep the settlements from being built for the reason that you said, which is already, I mean, the, 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 the chances of a two-state solution, both in terms of geography, but I would also say in terms of uh, Po politics um, it, it has, you know, far less of a prospect today than it did the day that I joined the Senate, which doesn't mean we have we can't give up. I mean, that's why what you guys are doing is so incredibly important. So, I want to approach this um, in, from two directions. The first will be this question of pressure, and then the 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 next question I have is more about affirmation. But on the pressure side. Uh, you know, I, you make a good point, Senator, which is that oftentimes when, you know, even the degree of pressure that President Obama uh, pursued, which is largely rhetorical, you know, can invite some uh, retrenchment in Israeli politics or re resistance to it. At the same time, you know, it, given the stat direction of the status quo, the question becomes what, what are the levers available? It, you know, Tommy talked about assistance. You know, another one that we wrestled with in the Obama administration was uh, the UN process. Um, and at the end of the, the very end of the administration, we abstained on a resolution, uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, crit critiquing uh, Israeli settlement construction along the same lines of as what we would say in our own words. Um, also, uh, condemned incitement on the Palestinian side. Um, I know you were uncomfortable with that, right? But you know, it, 
it, what are the you, what about the diplomatic international context? Is there is there any way in which, given that the UN has been one sided on this issue, would you rule out that the UN as a potential I, use of, of? I would not rule it out. Yeah. I would not rule it out. And I think that you know you've got a prime minister who's talking about annexation now. That's a, that's obviously a different situation than we were confronted with before, and we need to be paying attention to that now. In other words, we need to be thinking about. Uh, of course, we have no idea what the government is that's ultimately going to be formed. But if he w if he had been able to form the government, and he went through on his campaign promises on annexation, question that's a very profound question. It's a seismic question for the United States to answer, and I think we should be very careful about it, extremely deliberate about it, and it is a huge deal if you know if you were to try to do something like that. I was thinking on my way over here, and I was having some conversations with some people that. This is, uh, we're about 25 years, I think, from the anniversary of the peace with Jordan. So there you had a case where, you know, you had in, in, uh, in King Hussein and, in, and more so in Rabin and Clinton, people who had, in effect, domestic constituencies in each other's countries. And I think that was a powerful basis for the you know, that's an affirmative way of thinking about it, powerful basis of being able to create an enduring peace. So I'm not saying it's not part of what a president would use. I just think that, you know, we are so off track now. I mean, these guys basically have a permission slip from the Trump administration to do whatever uh, they want. And that is m one reason among about a billion why this guy should be a one-term president, because we can't give them this permission slip. So... It sounds like you, you know you, you, if you got to the extreme case of potential annexation, you'd evaluate these different tools. Um, the other way of looking at this too, though, is you mentioned the domestic political context in Israel, for example. One of the things that we admittedly struggled with was, you know, it, it's interesting. By the end of the Obama administration, Barack Obama polled at 70 or 80 percent in almost every country in the world, with the exception of Russia, Israel, and probably other countries in the Middle East. And, and we tried to communicate to the Israeli people. Obviously, we were dealing with the prime minister who was very actively working against President Obama, particularly in the last few years. If you were president, you know, given your long history on, the, on these issues, what would you try to do to reach Israeli public opinion? I, I would go to Israel, and I'd spend time in Israel, and I'd meet with students, and I'd meet with families, and I'd do whatever I could do to encourage a people-to-people -people relationship. The politicians cannot be relied upon here. You know, I, I, I really, we have a president who ran for office saying, I alone can fix it. Do you remember that? That's what he said. There's almost nothing less American or more unpatriotic you could say. And we were very careless with our democracy. We gave it up. The, the, we are each of us responsible for that. And it's never going to get back to where we need it to be unless each of us acts as citizens in a republic to make sure we restore the democratic republic that's being eroded and taken away from us for a whole variety of reasons. I think we need to do the same thing in the people-to-people -people relationship between us and Israel. We have a prime minister of Israel today who refers to Donald Trump as the best friend Israel ever had. And we have never had, I don't think, as anti-immigrant a president as the one we have, we have never had as anti-refugee uh, a president as the one we have. We've never had as anti-democratic a president. We have never had a president who didn't believe in the separation of powers, who didn't believe in freedom of the press, who didn't believe in all the things that make us a pluralistic society that we hope someday, for, you know, we, we, we will continue to be in that, and that Israel will have the chance to be. And... It says everything I think you need to know about how he views what's important about the relationship between the United States and Israel, which is that you have a president that supports his, his specific, you know, domestic ambitions. And that can't be what the United States stands for. Um, I just want to zoom out a bit for a second. I think... In Washington, we often talk about the Arab Spring as in the past tense. But I think if you look at Iraq, you look at Lebanon right now, you look at Sudan recently, 
these are ongoing protest movements and the structural challenges that led to these protest movements, whether it's corruption or economic inequality or you know, a hunger for universal rights and freedoms of expression, for example, the, you know, those challenges still remain. How would you view your job as president to try to push those countries to loosen up or deal with corruption to try to like let off some steam before these protest movements topple governments or create more instability or any of the things we've seen in the last decade. I so. think the most important thing for us to do is be able to set an example for the rest of the world. I don't think it's necessarily to lecture the rest of the world, and we're not, which I'm not, I'm not suggesting was the implication of your question, but I can't tell you, I mean, a lot of people in this room know that my mom and her folks were Polish Jews who survived the Holocaust in Warsaw, and then they spent two years there after the war was over. My mom was separated from her parents during the war, and, and so she called me when, you know, America was separating kids from the board, your parents at the border, saying, what are you doing about this? I see myself in these kids. And they went to Stockholm for a year after that, Mexico City of all places for a year. Then they came back here to America to rebuild their shattered lives. And I have met immigrants all over America. Never have I met ones with as thick an accent as my grandparents had. And yet they were the greatest patriots that I've ever known. They truly were. And so personally, I know how important it is for us to set a moral example of a free society. Not that we've been perfect, we've never been perfect, but the whole world is still waiting for us to set that example. And in the Middle East, people are waiting for it more than anywhere else because that's where the sectarian violence is. I think we have an opportunity, if we can find it, to support those little pockets here and there of civic you know, engagement in the, in the Middle East where there are universities and other organizations to help build some green shoots there. I mean, I think we should not be overly Pollyannish about how difficult it's going to be. And the other thing about the Arab Spring that we sort of never circled back to, and it's interesting because it has implications for how we think about it in our own country, is the role social media has played in, in the end, propping up tyrants more than helping people organize and galvanize for change. This is something that that generation of Colorado college kids out there and, and people like it are, are going to have to figure out how to, how to process because we, we are still 10 years later, 10 years after the Arab Spring sprung, dealing with um, effects of social media that I don't think any three of us would have ever predicted uh, back then. One of the issues that, that we worked on uh, together was the Iran nuclear agreement. Um, your vote on that was you know, very important. Um, you, you look like you're suffering some of the same PTSD as, as I did from those debates. Um, but going forward, you know, you've talked about you know, the, the need to pursue an expanded agreement. Um, you know, given the current status quo, though, where the U.S. was the one to pull out, the Iranians have then responded in kind, reaccumulating nuclear material. Um, would you first try to get back to the existing agreement as a platform to then seek an expanded agreement, or would you seek an entirely new kind of set of negotiations with the Iranians and our I don't, I don't think, first of all, stating the obvious for this group, but let me just state it because it wasn't obvious in 2016 when I voted for the Iran nuclear deal and I was the most, at that time, the most vulnerable Democrat who was up for election. And um, notwithstanding how persuasive President Obama sometimes can be or when he's beating you by <laughs> saying, I thought you were better than that, Michael. Uh, <laughs> or some argument like that. Uh, but, but back then, there was nothing I, the only thing I knew about the Iran deal really was that if I voted for it and they attacked me for it, it was the one thing I couldn't recover from. And I still voted for it because I thought it was the right thing to do. I say all that only to say this, by the time Donald Trump was president, the things that couldn't have been known when I voted for it were known, and, and not the least of which was our intelligence agencies and those all over the world said that Iran was more than a year from breaking out to a nuclear weapon. They'd, they had been two to three months when we put the Iran deal in place. There's a whole bunch of other things that cascade from that, but that's a pretty important thing, and he blew it up anyway. And so I'd say first, catastrophic mistake and anybody here who thinks that you know somehow he's intimidated Iran by doing what he's doing 
you, you only need to study the reports of the Iranian attack on the Saudi Arabian uh, oil infrastructure, the precision of that attack, and how that whole region is now having to think about their national security in the wake of a blown up Iran nuclear deal and in the wake of their demonstrated capacity, which we didn't really understand before to that degree. And therefore, I would uh, get the parties back together and say, where do you want to start, including the Iranians, including our allies and say, should we start with the deal as it was? I'd be happy to start with the deal as it was. Are there other things we'd like to negotiate? I was never, as you know, I never thrilled about the term of the agreement, w wish that ballistic missiles had been part of it. President Obama's argument, which I think is totally legitimate, was you're, if you're going to get something on ballistic missiles, you better believe they're going to want something uh, for that. So we should sit down with our eyes open on it and try to create the best deal we can. I think there are reasons to believe that there might be things that we could get that we didn't get before. There may be things Iran would want that Iran didn't get before. But do, I would not imagine that Iran would be approaching this negotiation from a position of weakness, I think, is the point that I want to make. Because this administration has been so catastrophically wrong when it comes to Iran, when it comes both to blowing up the nuclear deal, not responding to the, the, what Iran was doing in the Gulf or you know, in Saudi Arabia. They've created a very dangerous stew of unpredictable, uh, not to mention what they just did in Syria, which is obviously hugely beneficial to Iran. Um, no, no, no. It's, it's complicated. It's place. complicated. So you mentioned Saudi Arabia. Um, it seems like the majority of this administration's policies have been run through Saudi Arabia. You know, Jared Kushner is WhatsApping Mohammed bin Salman and cooking up whatever idiotic thing he's cooking up. And, you know, in the interim, President Trump is claiming that he's ending wars in the Middle East while sending U.S. service members to Saudi Arabia to help them work equipment that we sold them. Uh, meanwhile, the support for the civil war in Yemen is ongoing, despite the fact that it's a humanitarian catastrophe. How would you think about right-sizing the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia, especially understanding the tensions between the Saudis and Iran? Then that, but that's the reason why he's having to send, not have to, but why he's sending 15,000 troops is because uh, if he hadn't made the decision, Trump, if he hadn't made the decision he made on the Iran deal, he wouldn't be sending 15,000 troops to Saudi Arabia. And by the way, does anybody remember, you know, well, let me just, let's say, I mean, how do I say it this way? There's, we don't have a great history of having U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia, I think, is a way to think about this. And, and so it's as if, I mean, look, I think if I had to define the Trump doctrine for you, it would be take really bad situations and make them as bad as you possibly can. <laughs> That's what he's doing. And, and it's why we have to get him out. On Saudi Arabia, yeah, he, we shouldn't be sending those 15,000 troops. And, you know, when, when, a, when an, a, a putative ally of ours... Uh, orders the execution of a journalist who is based in Washington, D.C., and who goes to Turkey on a pretext and finds himself murdered by a crew of guys who've been sent there from uh, Saudi Arabia, that needs to be answered by us. And not only has it not been answered, we've rewarded that kind of behavior. And, and by the way, as with the Iran nuclear deal, I think pushing back on that is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. You know, it is an, it is an affirmation of who we are and the significant leadership position that this country needs to take in the world. That is something that has been completely undercut and eroded by Donald Trump. Yeah, and you know by who else? The Republicans in Congress who let him get away with this over and over and over again. It's, one last question. Um, I think you've spoken very powerfully and rightly about the interconnection between our democracy and our moral example and, and those values in the world. And one of the things that's been troubling in recent years is to watch that, you know, it's not just the United States where we've seen some erosion in the norms of our democracy. It's also Israel. Um, and how do you approach this issue um, in terms of how does the United States both reset its democratic example but go to a democratic ally like Israel and, and try to revitalize our kind of shared democratic example? Uh, how would you express concerns over some of the issues we've seen in Israeli politics where 
you know, there have been suggestions that minority rights should be kind of downgraded, uh, you know, for Palestinian citizens of Israel. How, how do you address this issue of, of our shared democratic example? I, I mentioned the word pluralism earlier, and I mentioned it on purpose because that is a, that's it. We, we still, I think, are the world's best example of a pluralistic society. And I think Israel has challenges that we don't have along those regards because of sectarian differences. But still, the, that's, the, that's the ultimate goal of, I think, a democracy, which is making sure that you're uh, giving every citizen the opportunity to participate on the theory that uh, the, the, the more voices you have, the stronger you are. That is not the way I think the Prime Minister views it. I don't think that's the way Donald Trump views it. That is the founders, that is how the founders of our country viewed it, and I would say the founders of Israel. The founders of our country did not set out to create a country where we would agree with each other. That wasn't the point. The point of living in a republic was that you would have disagreements with each other, and their hope was, their belief as Enlightenment thinkers was, out of those disagreements, we would create more durable and more imaginative solutions than any king or tyrant could have come up with on their own. That's how it's supposed to work. We have, we have utterly lost that in our national politics in America. I would say Israel has lost that from the moment as well. And where I would plead again is to the young people that are here. I was in a, at a, on a college campus this weekend. You know. There's a reason why democracy pours so poorly among young people in America. It pours so poorly among young people because they've never seen a democracy that actually worked very well. And it pours poorly among them because our country's been at war for 20 years. And what I say to them is, you've got to look for the example in our past. You know, we've never been perfect. Those same founders were the ones who, who perpetuated human slavery in the United States of America. Other Americans had to end that. And those people... I view as founders, you know, like Frederick Douglass, I think, is a founder just like the guys that wrote the Constitution. And, and, and the, the people that, you know, fought, mostly women, for my daughters to have the right to vote and for all the women here who have the right to vote, they're founders as well. And what I would say to you guys and to others in Israel is, whether you like it or not, and I think you should like it, that's what all of you are too. This democracy doesn't found itself automatically. It's a question of what every single generation does to make the country more democratic, more fair, and more free, because that, in the end, is how you strengthen a democracy, not weaken a democracy. And we face the same, we face different issues, but we face the same challenges and the same goals as Israel. And and I believe, going forward, we should be allies, both in terms of our national security interests, but also in our desire to be able to promote the idea of democracy in our own societies and around the world. If we don't do it and Israel doesn't do it, no one else will be able to do it. It's really that important. And thank you for everything you guys are doing to promote those ideals. Senator Bennett, thank you so much for being here. Senator Bennett.